Hey, welcome back to the boot camp series, or I should say, welcome back to a new chapter. So we just finished chapter one, which was design. And at this point, we know how to create a basic brochure type of website, and we know how to push it up onto the web using GitHub pages so that you can share the website with the whole world. This is great, but the web would be a very boring place if every website was just a static brochure that just sat there and didn't actually do anything. So the question becomes, how do we make our web pages or websites actually do something? Well, that's why we're in chapter two now, because the answer is to learn a little bit about programming. But what really is programming? Well, I think that's a question we want to answer both theoretically and practically or from a concrete perspective. So right now, let me show you a sneak peek preview of the finished product of what we're going to build together in this video. So it's just a simple text field and after every keystroke, when you type into the field, the headline below gets updated with that value plus is cool. Now in order to build this, we're going to need to learn a little bit about the language called JavaScript. Now this simple little project gives us something concrete to work towards, but we don't want to focus entirely on the concrete and ignore the theoretical. What I mean is we don't want to obsess on the web browser right away. From the very beginning, I want you to be aware that JavaScript is a general purpose programming language. It's not just for controlling the web browser, and if we actually learn the JavaScript language itself, we can use it to do just about anything. We can control servers, we can talk to databases with it, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. We're not going to be talking to servers or databases in this video. In this video, we are going to be working with the web browser. I just want you to not think of JavaScript as just the web browser language. So we're gonna break this video up into two parts. The first part is theoretical. The second part is the concrete example that you saw just a moment ago. Okay, now in this first part, the theoretical part, we're really gonna focus on two concepts. So even if you don't remember any of the syntax or code in this lesson, that's okay. Big picture, the whole point of this video is just to get you familiar with two concepts. Number one is functions, and number two is objects. Let's jump into the action and talk about them. So first, I want us to find a place where we can type JavaScript code. And I think the easiest way to find that is just from any website, right click, choose inspect. That will open your developer tools, only instead of this elements tab, we're not interested in that. Instead, we wanna click on the console tab. Okay, and here you see the cursor blinking. If you click right there, we can begin typing JavaScript. So we could say two plus two and then hit enter. If this doesn't impress you, I don't know what will. Uh, we're basically professional programmers now. Okay, we can also store a value in memory. So we could say, let my favorite number equal 10. Push enter. Okay, and now we have stored this value of 10 in memory with this name. So now if I say my favorite number plus three, push enter, we get 13, right? It stored the 10 in memory under this, plus three more. Okay, now that we've seen a little bit of JavaScript in action, let's talk about the two topics that we actually wanna cover. And they were functions and objects. So let's start with functions. What is a function? Well, to see an example of a function, type this in with me. Let's say alert, and then a pair of parentheses, so opening and closing parentheses, and then inside the parentheses, just include a number, let's say three, and then let's push enter. Okay, notice that displays an annoying alert pop-up here, and there's the value we provided. Let's click this okay button and go back to the console. So the web browser has a function named alert. You and I did not create the alert function, we're just using it or leveraging it or calling it. Okay, the idea is you write out a function name and then to call it, you include these parentheses and then inside the parentheses, you can pass it a little bit of data. We gave it a three, but you could also say alert parentheses and then inside them, you could include quotes if you want a string of text instead of a number. So opening quote, closing quote inside, you could say 
Hello, the sky is blue. Push enter. As you might have guessed, there's an annoying alert pop-up. Hello, the sky is blue. So it's the function name and then parentheses to call it. And then inside the parentheses, we call this data that we pass the function, we call this an argument. Now the web browser has this built-in or pre-existing function named alert, and we can use it or leverage it or call it. But what if we wanted to create our own brand new function? So for example, what I'm about to type out does not actually exist, but what if we wished that there was a function named double me and you could give it any number and then it would return whatever that number is doubled. So hypothetically, when I push enter, I would wish that this would return a value of 10. However, if I push enter, there is no magical function named double me, right? So we see an error message, double me is not defined. So the question remains, how would we create our own function named double me, where we can spell out exactly what we want this new function to do? Well, technically we could start spelling out the function right here in the console. However, writing multiple lines of code at once in the console is a bit awkward. You have to press shift and enter at the same time to drop down without just immediately running the code and it could get very confusing very easily. So big picture, what I'm trying to say is, let's go jump into a text editor. Since we're just experimenting and learning, I actually think this is a perfect use for CodePen once again. So from the CodePen website, we can just click Start Coding. Okay, and at this point, you and I are familiar with HTML and CSS. And now the third column, we see JS, which is JavaScript. So in this column, just as a quick test, you could say alert the number five. Right, and then we didn't even need to push enter because CodePen just immediately gives you a live preview of your code. So let's click OK to close that. Let's actually get rid of that annoying alert pop-up. The idea though is we now have this area where we can type more than one line of JavaScript code at a time without immediately running it. So back to the question at hand of how can we create or spell out our own brand new functions? And remember, we wanted to create the function named double me. Well, we just begin by actually typing out the word function and then a space, and then you make up a name for your function. So we were going to call it double me, and I capitalized the M in me. You could call this anything though. You could call your function pizza or unicorn. Let's go with double me though. And then directly after the function name, we want a pair of parentheses. And then after the set of parentheses, we want a pair of curly brackets. Now inside these curly brackets, that's where we explain what this function should actually do. So inside the curly brackets, it's common to drop down to a new line like this, just like in CSS, right? And now just as a quick test, imagine we wanted this function to show an alert pop-up that just shows the number four. Okay, now notice that didn't actually create an alert pop-up message. This is because we didn't actually run or call or execute this function. We're just sort of spelling out the recipe for what this function should do if it ever gets called. Now to actually use it or leverage it or call it, well, down here we could just say double me parentheses to actually call it. So now we do see the alert pop-up. Let's go ahead and close that. Okay, now remember the goal of double me was to double whatever number you gave it. So for example, when we actually call double me down here inside these parentheses, if we gave it a number of 10, well, then we would expect this to be 20, right? We want it to be doubled. So the question becomes inside our function recipe, how can we work with or access the incoming data, right? Or we call this an argument. We're passing double me an argument of 10. Well, when we spell out our function inside the parentheses right here, we just want to include a parameter. You could call it anything. We could call it X. Oops, CodePen is going to execute our code after every keystroke. But instead of X, you could call it anything. You could call it pizza. 
It's up to you to make up a name for your parameter, but the idea is that this corresponds with the first value that's getting passed into the function when we call it. Instead of pizza, let me put that back to x. Okay, now the idea is that inside the curly brackets for this function, or inside the body of the function here, we can access that incoming value with x. So if we just say alert x, that's just going to alert the exact value you pass in, right? So we see 10. However, if we say in these parentheses for alert, if we say x, and then in JavaScript, it's the asterisk for multiplication. So we could just say x asterisk two, and now we do see 20, right? So it was doubled. Now, while we are free to do whatever we want inside the body of a function here, right now I do want to stress something, a super important concept that I wish someone would have told me the very first day, the very first hour that I started learning to program. And that is that instead of just viewing a function as a shortcut for executing code, we also want to start viewing a function as something that boils down to a value. So what do I mean by this? Well, if we really think about what the double me function should do, well, it's even in the name itself. It should simply double whatever number you give it. Meaning this function shouldn't actually be responsible for alerting that number in a pop-up, right? We want our function to be pure and not have any side effects or do anything else other than sort of the job that it's designed to do. Let me show you what I mean. So when I say that we should also view a function as something that can boil down to a value, let's get rid of this alert line. So now the body of our function is empty and let's instead say return and then x asterisk two. I realize since this is the first time you're seeing this word return like this, this doesn't mean anything to you. But now let me show you how we can actually use this and begin to understand what it's doing. Let's get rid of this line where we call our function. So we just have our function definition and below it, let's do this. Let's say, let my favorite number equal and then let's call double me. So double me parentheses, uh, let's give it a value of five. And then let's also say right after that, plus double me, call it again, give it a value of 10. Okay, and then to actually see what this equals, maybe on a new line, we can just say alert in the parentheses. Whoops, if you don't type super quickly, it's going to execute with no value. Inside here, let's say alert my favorite number. Okay, you can see it gives me a value of 30, right? Because we're doubling five, which is 10, and then we're doubling 10, which is 20. So 10 plus 20 is 30. So this is what I mean that a function isn't always just sort of a shortcut to run code. It can also be something that boils down to a value or returns a value. Now, as we'll see later in this video, when we start using JavaScript to actually make the browser do something more interesting than just an alert pop-up, well, we'll notice that we don't need our function to return a value like this. So it's not like a function needs to return a value, but I just wanted to make sure that you saw this concept very early on. Because once we start doing more advanced things with JavaScript, this is a vital concept. And one of the biggest issues I see in students learning web development is that it's easy to get tunnel vision on using JavaScript to manipulate the web browser. And this comes at the cost of actually understanding JavaScript, the language itself, because HTML is just for web pages. CSS is just for decorating or styling content, but JavaScript is a general purpose programming language and controlling the web browser with it is just one of the many things that we can use JavaScript to do. And in future chapters in this bootcamp series, when we start using JavaScript to control a server or to talk to a database, we want to actually understand JavaScript and not just be a web browser puppeteer that has memorized a few web browser functions, but doesn't actually understand the programming language underneath it all. Now, big picture, if this concept of functions doesn't make sense yet, that's okay because it's something we're going to practice again and again. For now, all you really need to know is that a function can either be something that's basically just a command. We're just telling something to happen. 
And that could be something off in the distance elsewhere, like when we call the alert function. Or the function could also just be something that boils down to a value or returns a value. If the difference between those two things is fuzzy right now, that's okay. We'll revisit this later. Anyways, for now, that's enough theoretical talk about functions. Remember, we did have one other theoretical topic we wanted to cover before jumping into the concrete part of this video. So to refresh your memory, in just a little bit, we are going to work on this feature where you type into a field and then it shows you the is cool text down here after every keystroke. Okay, but before we get to this, the one other theoretical topic that I want to talk about is objects. So what is an object? Well, I want to begin by saying that objects are in a lot of different programming languages, but in JavaScript especially, objects are super important because almost everything in JavaScript is actually just an object. Before I try to use words to explain what an object is, Let's actually just look at one. So type this out with me. Maybe below all this other code, let's say, let meows a lot equal, and then a pair of curly brackets. Whoops, and CodePen automatically runs our code after we stop typing. So let's close out this alert. Let's actually comment out this alert line. So it's just two forward slashes right before alert. So now this code won't actually run and get in our way. Uh, let's keep typing out this code though. So let me a lot equals curly brackets. Okay, inside the curly brackets, we can drop down and let's say species colon quote. So that's an opening quote and a closing quote. Inside the quotes, let's say cat. After the quotes, let's say comma. Let's say eye color colon quotes green. One more comma. Let's say jump colon function, parentheses, curly brackets. Inside these curly brackets, I'll drop down and say alert, parentheses, imagine the cat just jumped. Okay, now I realized that was a lot of typing and a lot of different syntax because instead of saying something equal something, we used a colon. However, we now have our first example of an object. So what is an object? Well, we now have this one single meows a lot entity that contains multiple pieces of data, right? All three of these things, species, eye color, and jump, they all belong to the one meows a lot object. Now, I know we've been throwing around a lot of different vocabulary in this video, but there are just two more words that I want you to get familiar with. The two words are properties and methods. So species is an example of a property. Eye color is an example of a property, right? These are both just pieces of data. And then jump is an example of a method. It's a function or an action. So really a method is just a function, but we use the word method when it's a function that belongs to an object. Now the reason I had us type this out is because I wanna show you how we would actually use or access these things, these properties, in this method. So down below our object, we could say meows a lot dot species. And this would return a value of cat. Or if we said meows a lot dot eye color, this would return a value of green. If you really wanted to test it out, you could say alert parentheses meows a lot dot eye color. Right? And there we see the pop up. There's the value of green. Okay, and then finally, here's the actually interesting part. If we wanted to call the jump method, right? It's an action or a verb or a function. We call it a method because it's a function that belongs to an object. We could just say meows a lot dot jump, parentheses to actually call it. And there we see, imagine the cat just jumped. So, if all of this syntax and code here that I'm highlighting right now doesn't make sense, that's okay. Right now, all I really want you to absorb is that if you have an object, you can look inside it with the dot, and then you can access any of its properties or methods, right? Any of the things that live inside it. So meows a lot dot species, dot eye color, dot jump. Now objects are an incredibly complex and deep and rich topic in JavaScript, but for now, this is all I wanted to cover. So at this point, we're done with the theoretical aspect of this lesson. 
We know how to create a function. We know how to call a function. It's just the name of it and then parentheses to call it. We know that you can pass a function, a little bit of a value here with an argument. And we've taken a first look at an object. An object can help us stay organized. It can have multiple pieces of data or abilities inside it. And then the syntax to actually work with it is just dot. You look inside an object with dot. With just this little bit of knowledge, we are now ready to jump into this example where you type into this HTML field and after every keystroke, it adds is cool into this headline down here on the fly. Okay, without further ado, let's get started and build this together right now. So let's start with a brand new empty pen in code pen, or you could just go back to the pen we've been typing in throughout this lesson and just take everything in your JavaScript column, just delete it so you have a clean empty slate. Okay, now since the screen that I'm recording on is fairly small, I'm gonna hide the CSS column, so just drag the JavaScript column over like this, and then I will keep the HTML column. So now we just have HTML and JavaScript. So in the HTML, let's add uh, an input field that you can type into. So you can just say input, and then hit tab on your keyboard. So that creates an input element. The input element type does not need a matching closing input tag. You just need the opening tag like this. Okay, right below that, let's have a heading level one. So just H1, hit tab. Let's say, please enter a name. Okay, then right below that, just for a bit of placeholder text, let's have a paragraph and then inside it, hit lorem, tab, cool. Okay, so down in the preview area, now we just wanna use JavaScript so that when you click into this field and start typing, we wanna take whatever value you currently have and then adjust this headline to say that string of text or that name is cool, right? And we want this to run or update after every keystroke, right? Every time you enter a new character into this input field. So how in the world would we make this happen with JavaScript? Well, I think the first step would be to select this input field element or just to begin working with it. So first in our HTML, let's give this input element a unique ID so that we can target it or select it with our JavaScript. So on this input element, let's give it an attribute of ID equals quotes, and then we could make up any name, but why don't we give it a value of our input? I capitalized the I in input, but you don't need to. You just need to type this exactly the same way you typed it here over in your JavaScript. Okay, anyways, over in the JavaScript, now the question becomes, how do we select or start working with this element? Well, type this in with me. In JavaScript, we wanna say document. So remember earlier when we had the object named meows a lot and it contained different properties and methods? Well, the document object exists in all web browsers, so we don't have to create it. It already exists. We're just leveraging it or using it. And document sort of represents the web page as a whole. So it represents all of the content on the page and also all of the different abilities of the web browser. Now, remember from earlier to look inside an object, you just say dot. So we wanna look inside the web browser's document object for something called get element by ID. And this is a method, so parentheses to actually call it, right? A method is just a function that belongs to an object. And the spelling and capitalization here really matters. You have to spell it exactly correctly. So the E to start the word element needs to be capitalized, the B in by and the I in ID, okay? Then in these parentheses, we say quotes and we just, type in the matching ID that we gave that element. So it's our input. Now this function, or I should say this method of get element by ID, it doesn't actually make anything happen. Instead, it just boils down to a value or it returns a value. And it's going to return an object that represents this one specific HTML element, right? Our input field. Now, because what this returns is an object, that means that the object is just sort of floating in outer space or floating in memory right here. So we can look inside that object that gets returned, 
with a dot, so we could say dot, and then it has a property named value, and that controls the value of this input field. So if we say dot value equals quotes, hey. Well, notice down in our preview, the word hey is now in that input field. Now, this is not what we actually wanted to do. We don't actually want to manipulate or change what's in this input field. I just wanted to show you that this returns an object that represents that HTML element. Okay, instead, let me show you what I would actually do. So let's get rid of this dot value equals hey. So we just have our document get element by ID function call. And at the very beginning of this line, let's say, let me make this a bit wider. At the very start of the line, let's say const our input equals. Const is very similar to earlier when you'd see me say let and then you make up a name and set it to equal something. The difference is with const, it is a constant variable, which means you can't update the value. So whatever we're setting it to equal here is what it's always going to equal. Now, as we saw just a moment ago, you don't need to store the object that this returns in a variable like this. You can just select elements on the fly and work with them, but I feel like this is a more organized way of doing it. So now on a new line of code, we can say our input. And like we saw before, we could say dot value equals hey, right? And that works. Or we could say our input dot remove, right? Call a method of remove, and that's going to delete it from the page. So the idea is this object represents, let me get rid of the dot remove, this object represents this field. So now there's all sorts of different properties and methods that it contains that let us do something interesting to this element. Now the one that we're actually interested in is a method called, so let's say dot, it's a method called add event listener, parentheses to call it. And again, the capitalization here needs to be exact. So it's capital E, capital L, but this method lets us listen to certain events happening to this element. Now, when we call this method in the parentheses, we need to give it two arguments. So just as placeholders, you could say A comma B. The first argument we give it is the type of event that we wanna listen for on this element. So do we wanna listen for when it's clicked on? Do we wanna listen for when it's hovered over? Do we wanna listen for when you press a key on it, even if it's just the arrow keys on your keyboard? Well, no, we specifically want to listen for when it changes or when it receives an input that actually changes its value. So instead of this A placeholder, we would say quotes, and then we're not interested in click or hover or any of those. We're interested in an event type of input. Okay, and the way that this add event listener method works is now anytime the web browser detects this event on that element, well, it's going to call whatever function we provide here for this second argument. Let me show you how this works. So first, let's go create a function, right? So down here, let's say function, and let's just call it maybe amazing function, parentheses, curly brackets. Inside it, let's have an annoying alert that says, hello. Okay, now back on this line, for the second argument, instead of B, we just point towards our function. So we don't actually call our function though. So we just say amazing function. We don't need parentheses right after it because we don't wanna call it in this exact moment. We're just passing a reference to our function and it's up to this method to call it at the exact correct moments, right? Whenever this event happens. So now if we actually go down into our preview area and if you type a letter into this input field, we see our hello alert, that means our function ran. So now each time you press a key, each time it detects that type of event, it's going to run our function. Okay, now we don't actually want this annoying alert, so let's get rid of that within our function here. Instead, what we actually want to do is change the text of this headline to take whatever value you've entered and then say, is cool. So if we want to work with this headline element, let's be sure to give it an ID over in our HTML. So on the opening H1 tag here, let's give it an ID, say ID equals quotes. You could name it anything, but I'll name it our header. Okay, and then back in our amazing function, you could just select this element directly, or just to stay organized, I like to select all of my elements at the top of my JavaScript. So you could even just 
copy and paste and duplicate this first line that we already have. So just duplicate it and change the constant variable name to our header. And then it equals the same method call, only these quotes should have a value of our header. Okay, so now we have this object of our header that represents this one specific HTML element. So down in our amazing function body, we can just say our header dot, right? To look inside an object, you just say dot. And I'll let you know that there's a property named inner text, and the T is capitalized, that controls the value for this element. So if we say inner text equals quotes, hello. Well, let's test it out now. So as soon as I enter a character into the input field, cool, the header text changed to hello. Now we don't actually want it to say hello, so let's get rid of this. What we would actually want it to say, so inner text equals, we'd wanna grab our input, so our input dot value, right? That's going to pull whatever you've currently typed into this field. And then we're going to add on, so the plus symbol, quotes. And let's start with an empty space so the words don't run together. So it's just the value plus space is cool. Okay, now let's test this out. So if I click down here, B-R-A-D. Awesome. So you can type in any name you want and it gets updated after every keystroke. Now for one final detail, let's adjust it so that if you backspace or delete it so that the field is empty once again, we don't just want it to say, nothing is cool like this. We would want it to switch back to say, please enter a name. Let me show you how we can set that up. Within our amazing function here, let's actually copy this line of code into our clipboard because we're going to want it back in just a moment. So I'm just gonna cut it temporarily and we're going to use something called an if statement. So we say if parentheses, after the parentheses, curly brackets, after the curly brackets, let's say else, and then another pair of curly brackets. Let me explain how this works. So in these parentheses here, we list a condition. And if that condition is true, then whatever lives inside these parentheses will happen. Otherwise, or else, if the condition is not true, then whatever lives inside these curly brackets will run. So for the condition, let's just say in these parentheses, if our input dot value. Essentially, as long as this doesn't equal an empty string of text, or as long as it's not undefined, as long as it's something, then this will evaluate to true. So in these curly brackets, we can drop down. I'll just paste in my clipboard here. And then in the else curly brackets, I'll drop down in between them. And this is where we would want it to say, please enter a name. So I'll just say our header dot inner text equals quotes, please enter a name. Okay, let's test this out. So in the input field down here, if I spell out my name, perfect. But if I backspace so that the field is empty once again, perfect. Now I know towards the end of this video, we started to move a bit quickly. And if you weren't able to keep up and your example isn't working, that's okay. In the description for this video, you'll find a link to my exact working code pen example. So you can click on that, experiment, dissect it, borrow, copy and paste from the code, so on and so forth. Okay, but let's talk about where we go next from here. Let me actually show you some sneak peek preview footage of what we're going to build together in our next video. So we're going to use JavaScript to build a slideshow, but what makes it interesting is these are not our images. Instead, we're going to use JavaScript to talk to another website and dynamically fetch the URLs for images on the fly. And then we're going to use JavaScript to add those to our page and every few seconds switch which image is being displayed. I think this will be a really fun exercise to learn both more about JavaScript and also just more about programming in general. However, before I finish recording that next lesson and post it here on YouTube, I am going to wait several days. And that's because I really want you to go watch the 10 part series on my channel called The 10 Days of JavaScript. It's a freely available playlist. You can find a link to it in the description of this video. 
If you feel like the video we just worked through moved a little too fast or didn't explain the why and how behind every little concept, then I think you're going to love the 10 days of JavaScript. Essentially, I've already explained the basic building blocks of JavaScript in detail in a 10-part video series already. So for the next few nights, your homework is just to go check out that series. If you're already familiar with all those concepts, that's great. But if you really are a beginner, I think there's a lot to soak up and absorb from that series. Now, either way, whether you check out the 10 days of JavaScript or not, in a few days from now, we will jump into that next video where we build the dog slideshow. If you're enjoying this bootcamp series so far, I'd appreciate it if you could share the link with your friends and family. I'll see you in a few days for the next video. Take care.